We're going to talk today about, I think it's chapter 14, the age of exploration. So um, what's going to happen about the same time that the Reformation is taking place is that we have uh, a lot of movement of people in different parts of the world. Europe is expanding. Europe is moving into what we would call the New World, as well as to the Old World, that is to India, uh, connections with China, uh, connections with Africa. So there's a lot of movement. That's, we're kind of focusing on Europe, but there's going to be a lot of movement during this time, right around 1500, and it's also right around the time of uh, the Reformation. Okay. So this chapter, we kind of look not at the Reformation, but at the age, what is often called the age of exploration. Now the Portuguese are going to be the first ones to lead this. The Portuguese then are great sailors. Um, it's a very small country, really, but they have a great impact because of their sailing and their navigation. They begin sailing, of course, around the Mediterranean, but they also begin to sail down the coast of Africa. Okay, what would be the northwest, the northwest part of Africa, so Morocco and, and, and down that that way. They begin to sail down that way. The guy who really leads it, this is supposed to be what he looked like. I don't know for sure, but it is a painting of Prince Henry, sometimes called Prince Henry the Navigator who rules in Portugal and who sets up a school for navigators. That's how he gets his nickname um, a little bit earlier. So the, the Portuguese are already know how to build ships. They already know how to sail ships. And now what they're learning is how to navigate ships. And really, a lot of what they're learning about navigating ships, they have learned from uh, really from Arabs, the improvements that Arabs have made. Because remember, there are a lot of Arabs in the, on the Iberian Peninsula, Spain and Portugal, using astrolabes and stuff like that to look at the stars to navigate. Anyway, that's the kind of stuff they're doing. Now, at this time, what you have to remember, the trade is controlled by really the people in the Middle East. All right? Trade is controlled by mostly Arab merchants. They are the ones who are getting the goods from India, perhaps from China, things from sometimes it's called the Silk Road. This stuff is making its way through the Middle East and out to Europe and back and forth. So the real middleman, the people who are really making a lot of money on this whole process, are the people in the Middle East. They're the merchants. Now. Those things include spices, silk, other luxury items, but it also includes slavery, slaves, slaves from Africa primarily. The slaves from Africa really begin with the Muslims, and it begins over here in East Africa, over in this area right here, you know, like around Somalia and so forth, okay, so over here. Uh, and so when the Portuguese begin to sail, here's where Portugal is in the orange, they begin to sail south, say to the Canary Islands and then on south. Okay, Portugal then wants to get in on this trade because it's lucrative, it's a lot of money. The problem is they, don't, they, they know if they try to go overland, it's just too hard. They can't do that. Plus, you got all the, all the Arabs, the Muslims there who don't want them to do that, so it's going to make it even harder. So they decided, well, maybe, and nobody knew how big Africa was. Nobody had a map like we see in front of us here to know just how big Africa was. Some people thought Africa was much smaller. Some people thought Africa was maybe just, you know, just that big. And you just kind of go right around it, and there you'd be right at India, see? So they didn't really know. They also didn't know the shape of Africa. They didn't know. Some people thought Africa just kind of curved around kind of like Europe curves around up here. Africa curved around here and almost met India. So if you went around this way, you'd be in India. So you know, it's just like a little opening, much like you have here into the Mediterranean, have a little opening into the, into the sea here. In other words, people didn't know the geography. 
So the Portuguese begin sailing south along Africa. And they find out Africa's a lot bigger than they thought. So their hopes <coughs> of getting quickly to where the spice is, not going to work. However, they say, you know what? Europeans have been buying slaves from Muslims for a long time. We could get involved, the Portuguese say, in slave trade and make some money that way until we figure out other things or in addition to figuring out other things. So, along this coast of Africa then, we're going to call it the west coast of Africa, and down to this sort of horn of, of, or, or of hump of Africa here, you see. This is where the slave trade begins for Europeans, and it begins with the Portuguese. Okay? They begin getting people from here and bringing them back up here and selling them as slaves. All right, so in 1441 is the first time the Portuguese do this. It's not the first time it's done because, remember, the Muslims have been doing it for a long time. And the reason I emphasize that is I've had people ask me or say to me that, you know, sort of imply that Muslims never dealt with slave trade. That's simply not true. Muslims were in heavily in the slave trade for a long time. And in fact, that's where the Europeans learned sort of how to do it. Anyway, I'll just leave it at that. Now, what they're doing is they're bypassing the Muslim African slave trade, which is mainly coming from over here in East Africa, because the Muslims have been going down this area, down the Red Sea, and down to this horn of Africa here, and uh, obtaining people there and then bringing them back, bringing them back into the Middle East, using them as slaves here, using them as, and selling the slaves in Europe, and so forth. So this is the way the Portuguese begin to make money on this deal. Now the other thing they find as they head down this way, on this, this kind of hump, we're going to call that the hump of Africa, right down in here. The hump of Africa actually has gold. When they encounter the people there, they notice the people have pieces of gold, you know, like necklaces and, I don't know, other jewelry kind of things, right? Uh, that gets them very interested. Where this gold is coming from uh, is down the Niger River, most of it, and other tributaries. There's a big river right about here. And the people are finding it kind of like you pan for gold, right? They find it in the sand, they find it along the banks of the river, and I'm sure they're actively looking for it as well, right? So uh, much like panning, this is, there's two ways to get gold. You can just kind of go in and mine it out of the ground, or you let it erode out, and it comes down a river or stream. And a lot of the gold that people find is actually from panning it, or from, from rivers and streams. Anyway. That's where they get it. So this sometimes says it gets called the Gold Coast of Africa. So that's another thing they're very interested in. What they are not interested in at all is moving anywhere inland or establishing any colonies. The Portuguese really don't want to establish colonies almost anywhere. They do want harbors, safe harbors. But they're not interested in coming in here, you know, setting up plantations or growing things. They don't, you know, we're here for trade. Portuguese? Some to some extent, the Portuguese have some some colonies later, but that's not really they're not, they're not really for that. they're not really big into colonization. Not like say the British or, or, French. or the French. Yeah. Okay, so the Portuguese are mainly in this for trade. Making money by commerce. So the three things then that they begin uh, obtaining from Africa that they trade, slaves, gold, and ivory. We didn't mention ivory before, but ivory uh, they, they find here. You know, one time I mentioned in class that they had ivory and that they would take it here and they would sell it. And then somebody said, well, what is ivory? And I said, it's, well, it's the, from the tusks of elephants. And then I had somebody in one of my classes, not at this school, who said, 
So that's where the soap comes from, from elephant tusks. You know, there's ivory soap. She thought that ivory soap was from elephant tusks. Anyway, I get all kinds of questions. This is why sometimes you wonder, why do I phrase things in certain ways? It's because I've heard things over the years. So I want you to be clear, this is ivory that comes from the tusk of elephants, and it's not soap. Okay? You know, anytime you read a rule or some description, you think that's really weird. Why is that there? It's because someone has, you know, done that. Someone has. Anyway, you got a question? Yeah. yeah you want to know if it's soap? No. Is that why uh, the country is somewhere in the, I think it's northwest, whatever. Which so, one? The uh, Ivory Coast. Oh, the Ivory yeah. Coast. Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, that's right in this yeah. area. All right. So the Ivory and the Gold. Okay. They, they don't really colonize. They do build some stone forts along the coast, you know, right near the coast. And, they, and anytime there's an island nearby, they, they go out on that island and build a fort for a harbor. Okay? Now, just so we're clear, I don't know how you think they did their slave trade. Maybe you think the Portuguese just sailed up to the shore and they jumped off their boat and they went and grabbed a bunch of guys and threw them on the boat. And sailed away. That's not really accurate. The slave trade that took place here wasn't just the Portuguese that got involved in it. And this is what we don't often talk about. The people who lived along the coast would go in and capture people who lived further in, who were their enemies, people they didn't like. So if we're from one tribe or group that's along the coast and we don't like these other people further inland, well, we capture them. Now, when we used to fight them and capture them, we'd probably just kill them. But now instead of killing them, we tie them up and we keep them prisoner until the Portuguese show up. Then we take them out and trade them to the Portuguese for good. So that means that people along the coast of Africa were also involved in slave trade. We don't usually talk about that, but they are. And that's usually how it worked. So the, you know, they just knew, the, the tribes along the coast just knew that when the Portuguese show up, they would pay money for these guys or give them goods, whatever they wanted, trade them like they would for the ivory and other things. That's how it happened, in a nutshell. Okay, well, let's move on because the Portuguese are not going to be satisfied with that. They're still looking for the spices because that's to them is where the real money is. So they keep sailing all the way down. They keep sailing down along Africa. They don't know how big it is, and finally they're going to find the end of it. Finally, they end up naming the end of Africa the Cape of Good Hope. Because they got good hope they finally got to the end of this continent. Because it's so big. It's huge. Or huge, however you guys say it now. So in 1487, they finally round. Bartholomew Diaz rounds the Cape of Good Hope, which has some rugged terrain. You see in the picture here. And this is him from a... I think it's a stamp, or maybe it's money. Anyway, that's him, or an image of him. And so uh, he wants to keep going, but guess what? The guys on his ship say, you know what, Bartholomew? We have come a lot further than we ever thought, and we don't know how much further we got to go, and we just want to go home. So they kind of, he feared they would mutiny, and so basically he just turns back then, but he proves he now has mapped how far you got to go to get around Africa. Because he knew he was starting to go north now instead of going south. All right, so the Portuguese, again, like I said, are good at navigation. They're good at sailing. They're good at shipbuilding. And with this information, it's not going to be long, and they're going to be back, and they're going to go around the Cape of Good Hope, and they're going to keep going. So here is the route of Bartholomew Diaz. Okay, and here's where he turns back. Okay. Good enough. But you see how much further they got to go. But they've come the, they've come the farthest way. Now, the guy who's actually going to round the Cape of Good Hope is a guy named Vasco da Gama. That would be a great name for your firstborn. Vasco. Vasco. That's a good name. <laughs> see, you like that name. That's good. I'm, I'm, I'll be looking for an email with a picture of little baby Vasco. <laughs> Vasco. You don't have to call him Gama, but that would be a good middle name. Vasco da Gama Smith. Okay. Anyway. So he rounds Africa. 
And then what he finds out is as he's sailing up the coast, he starts running into Muslims. Because remember, the Muslims have been sailing down Africa the other way. They've been sailing down the, the east coast of Africa. And so he actually runs into settlements, you know, which there's Africans there, but there's also Muslims there. So he gets there, and, you know, he decides, why reinvent the wheel? I need to get to India. I'm not really, I don't really care about Africa at this point. I'd like to get to India. So he goes into one of these towns, and he says, anybody here been to India? Probably not quite this way, but... Yeah, anybody here know how to get there? Anybody here a navigator? Some guy says, yeah, well, I'll pay you some good money, goods, if you show me how to get there. So the guy says, hey, it sounds good to me. So he gets on the Portuguese ship. He's a Muslim navigator, and he shows them how to get to India. Okay? Once the Portuguese know, they won't be hiring any more Muslim navigators, okay? They now know how to do it. From then on, they're going to go there themselves directly. So they sail to India, and they come to what would be the west coast of India. And we'll move on. Everybody got that? It's not much to write there. And then here's the map that shows his route. They come down, come around. See, they already knew how to do that. They pick up this guy. They would stop at Mombasa. One of my favorite towns, names, I like that name, Mombasa, Madindi. So, and then, you know, they get the Muslim navigator, and then they, he tells them pretty much how to get there pretty directly, and they end up at Calicut, which is pretty far south. Eventually, they're going to set up a base, a harbor at Goa. And in fact, the Portuguese control Goa, now get this, the city of Goa, the Portuguese controlled it until the 1960s. That's how long the Portuguese were there, right? From around 1500 to 1960. So 400, like 460 years the Portuguese were in, in Goa. I've been to Goa, it's been an interesting town. Well anyway, and that's where they set up their base of operation. Because they, they've always heard all the spices come from India. Well, once they get there, they find out most of the spices do not come from India. The, the people in India are middlemen. I mean, they're, they're bringing it in from elsewhere. And so the Portuguese say, okay, I guess we've got to sail a little more. And so the Portuguese are going to follow those routes out to where the spices actually come from. They're not going to stop in India. Yes? Okay, it's called Diego Suarez because they say that it was discovered by uh, Portuguese Diego Diaz. Diego Diaz. Right. Okay. Which which place is discovered by the? Oh, like Madagascar, but then the north. Oh, Madagascar. Right. Yeah. North, like the tip north. Okay, up here. Diego Suarez. Yeah. Yeah. So I was wondering, did you? Was is that actually true? I don't. I'd have to check that. Okay. It sounds to me like it would be true, depending on how you define discovered. This said that it was 1500 too, though. 1552, yeah. so I would... Well, that's... the other one was, you said, was 14. That would be, you know, the thing is, when a lot of times when we say something was discovered, it, it wasn't that nobody knew about it, right? There were people living there. They knew, they didn't, you know, they knew about it for a long time. Right. It's just so that it might be when the Europeans first knew about it, right? So that would be probably right. The Portuguese would have been there first before any other Europeans, any other Western power. Yeah, I was thinking though, like, so you never heard about him? So it's not like I've heard of him, yeah, but I don't know if that you know that spot. I'd right. have to look. Okay. But that sounds correct to me because the Portuguese, if you use the word discovered, it's kind of loaded, right? Christopher Columbus discovered America, <laughs> but there were a lot of people here. He discovered it for the Europeans. The Europeans had no idea there were even continents out there. We're going to talk about that in a minute if we get there. Otherwise, I'll talk about it in my office. You can listen to it later. But, well, if you do listen to any of it, I don't know if anybody listens to any of these things. I guess I can go on there and look and see how many times it's been played, but that's just too depressing. I don't want to do that. <laughs> you know, I have to spend all this time doing it, and like three people, and I know two of those are me just looking at it. <laughs> 
Okay. Anyway, so yes, that sounds correct to me, depending on how you use the word discovered. That is, that is undoubtedly the Portuguese are the first ones, first Europeans to come to Madagascar. Yeah, that, that I would think is definite. It's like you might say the Portuguese discovered Goa, but I mean, Goa was already there. Okay? So I mean, that's the way it always, I mean, it's for, you know, some people say they discovered the moon. Well, the moon's been out there a long time. All right. Anyway, when does he get to beautiful India? He sails into the harbor of Calicut, May 18, 1498. You get that? 1498. You remember our good buddy Columbus is sailing the other way in 1492. So he actually gets there six years before this, roughly. And uh, but of course, by, you know, the Spanish knew by that time there's no way they're going to outdo the Portuguese with what they were doing their way. So they decided we'll talk about that to go a different direction. Well, what does he do? He loads up his ships with spices, bargain basement prices, right? Bargain basin, basement prices on those spices, and so he loads up his ship, and he sails back to Portugal, and he is a hero because he's made a lot of money, and he's proved that you can get from Portugal to India, and you can get spices, and you can come back. But now, of course, once they start doing that, they figure out that, you know, these guys in India have been pulling a fast one on him. They, they're not, these spices, most of them are not coming from India at all. So there's two things the Portuguese want to do. They not only just want to get involved in the spice trade, they want to control it completely. That's what you got to remember. The Portuguese want to control it completely. What does that mean? We got to cut out all the competition, like the Arabs, and we got to go. We got to buy direct. We got to go to the plate. Where is this stuff at? Where is this stuff coming from? And so they follow the ships there, and when they get there, they just take it over, and then they they control that as well. So they not only control the spices, but the the places where they're grown, and the shipping, and the sales. It's a monopoly. So they have to break the Arab monopoly. The Arabs have controlled this, so they put a blockade on Arab ships in the Red Sea. The Red Sea, of course, is, is between, between you know, Africa, what would be Egypt and Mozambique and all those areas, Somalia, and uh, the Arabian Peninsula. They put a blockade there, and they simply do not let the ships out or ships in with any goods. And since the Portuguese were such great sailors and they were such good shipbuilders and they had smaller, more maneuverable ships, they could outrun, they could outcircle the Arab ships. So they ended up winning. Now, they couldn't stop the overland routes, but the overland routes, quite frankly, took a lot longer. You know, so they didn't completely cut out the Arabs, but they certainly pretty much eliminated all their sea trade, which was the biggest part of it, okay? The guy who does this is this guy pictured here, our good buddy, Alfonso de Albuquerque. That'd be a good name for your son, Alfonso. Yes? I have a question. But the Arabs, they were also selling other things than just spices, right? Well, they're selling silk and spices and incense. Clothes, right? What? Clothes, too. Clothes. Well, yes. Yeah, they were weaving cloth. Right? And, you know, the silk would fall into the cloth range. Okay. And they had dyes, you know, they had, you know, different things like, yeah, so, I mean, you know, the Arabs are, I'm not worried about them. They're going to make some money. But it's not, it's not the cash cow it used to be. Because a lot, and, you know, that pretty much they had, they still had, like, the, the incense market. Because that was mostly coming from Arabia and East Africa, and they pretty much controlled that. But the spice trade was very lucrative. And this is really going to hurt them on that. And so most everything's going to have to come overland now. Because the Portuguese are going to be patrolling this like, like the alligators could patrol the lake out there. Just don't stick your toe in, it's gone. The alligators are everywhere. And they're looking for you and your feet. So keep that in mind. Don't dangle your toes off the dock. <sighs> Anyway, I don't, I'm sure it'll be fine. Nothing to worry about. 
You know where they also said that? The Titanic. Anyway. They established God. <laughs> that's what I always tell people. People tell me, oh yeah, don't worry about it. I say, yeah, that's what they said on the Titanic. Yeah, don't worry about it. We got it all covered. Established the city of Goa as a training post. Like I said, and they were there until I think it's 1963. I don't know, something like that. You can look it up. But it's, it's a long, long time. They've actually only been out of India for, you know, like 40, 50 years. They were there that long. And, of course, well, this is south of Bombay, or what today is called Mumbai. I'm going to give a different name for everything, but I give you, try to give you both names. Now, they're going to they begin to use this as a land base in 1510, and like I said, they're there until about 1960, let's say. So, 450 years. That's a long time. And they not only were blockading Arab ships, but guess what? They start regulating Indian ships, that is, the ships from India. Say, hey, where do you think you're going with those spices? Because they knew what was going to happen, is they just have the ships from India sail over to the Red Sea and then load them onto Arab ships or whatever. And, you know, no, no, we're going to cut that out too. You guys don't ship this anywhere that direction. We don't want the Arabs getting any of this. All right? So that's our good buddy Alfonso. And, and they named a whole city after him, right? I think it's interesting. They named the city of Albuquerque, which is in the middle of a desert, long way from the water, for an admiral. I don't know why. That's not my area. You can look that up on your own. So, okay, here's where Goa is. And there's Mumbai. Okay, so they, they came along this way, sailed up the coast to here. And they begin controlling the Arabian Sea and all this area here. But they find out everything is coming from over this way. So they decide, you know what? We're going to head that way. Albuquerque sails then further, further east to a group of islands known as the Malakas. They find out on the Malakas that they have all kinds of spices like cloves and nutmegs and I think black pepper and just all kinds of other spices. And so what does he do? He just conquers it. I mean, it's not hard to conquer. These people don't really have weapons, Not certainly not like the Portuguese, who have, by the way, gunpowder and guns and cannons and swords and armor and horses. You know, he overwhelms them. No problem. He takes them out. He controls it. And he just tells them, hey, you guys just keep doing what you're doing, except now it's our stuff. All right? And then from there, guess what? He's not satisfied there either. He knows that there's silk and other stuff in China. And he says, well, I can't be that far. And so he starts to inquire. And then he begins sailing north. So the Portuguese then are the first Europeans to reach China since Marco Polo. And they set up a base of operation there as well. So they conquer the Malakas and the Molokas. The Molokas are known as the Spice Islands. Some people just call them the Spice Islands because they have all the spices on it. And you know, of course, they're home to one of my favorite bands, the Spice Girls. All the Spice Girls are born on the Spice Islands. See, let's see, there's, there's ginger and nutmeg and uh, uh, paprika and uh, cinnamon and uh, scary. One of them is scary, I don't know. I think all the, all the Spice Girls should actually have Spice names. The fact that only one of them, I think, had a Spice name is a misnomer. They should all have that. But, you know, my favorite, my favorite out of all the Spice Girls is really their mother, Old Spice. Okay. No? Come on! <laughs> old, old Spice, that's, that's their mother. Okay. Hey, the spy, people still remember the Spice Girls. Someday they won't, but I'll still be telling that joke. 30 years from now, you come back here, I'll still be using that joke. I've been using that joke for a long time. I don't intend on stop using it. I got no writers. These guys on TV, you know, they got like 15 people writing for them just for you know, like five minutes. I got nothing. I got to go hours every week. Anyway, clothes, nutmeg, all originally came from here. Black pepper, you know is the number one spice used around the world, black pepper. Comes from this area as well. 
And most of these are, you know, things that come off flowers, or, you know, like the parts of flowers, or, or you know, some of them are not really nuts, but it's the fruit. Anyway, we're not going to get into all the technical thing. Some of it, like cinnamon, is bark. It's just the bark of a plant. Yeah. Actually, is that just specific to these islands? Like, the stuff they talk about? Yeah, I mean, that's the only place where they're from. Now, of course, today they've been cultivated elsewhere, but that's where they began. Yeah. That's where the spices were from. They didn't grow anywhere else. Just like you, you can only grow tea in very limited places. And most all of that's in China. So if you want tea, you get it from China. Now, you know, they, they were able to cultivate it on, you know, on Sri Lanka and a few other places. And in the eastern part of Turkey, they do it a little bit. They've tried to do it here in the United States. It's just not, the climate's not right. You gotta have sort of a, 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 a cooler climate. You gotta have some hills. Anyway, that's for tea. But if you take a look at specific foods and spices and things, this is where it came from. Just like chickens. Chickens came from Asia. But now they're all over the world. How did they get there? The chickens don't even fly well. People took them there, that's why. Right? Because chickens are very handy. Very portable. I've been on buses where, you know, people just come in carrying a chicken. Taking it home for dinner. You, you can just, you know, like tie it and hang them around your neck and put them in a canoe. I mean, there's all kinds, you know, chickens, it's not like a cow. You're not moving a cow easily, but a chicken you can move. And they reproduce fairly quickly, so it doesn't take too long to get a full grown chicken. And they don't eat much, just the bugs. It's a perfect food. Don't get me started. How'd you get me started on chickens? Let's go on. Other spices in here, you know, like pepper, black pepper especially. All of these things are coming from these islands. Almost all of it. Okay? And that's where it originates. Now, sometimes it has successfully been cultivated elsewhere now. And of course, now you go down, and you go over there, and what do we got? Like, what do they like to around here? Publix. You go to the Publix not too far from here. You go down to Spice Island, you can buy like every kind of spice they got probably for 50 bucks. You know, you get some of each. No problem. Get cinnamon, pepper, and you know, whatever. Nutmeg, all that stuff. It's cheap. You get a little container for two bucks. Not so here. During this time, very expensive. And if you lived without spices for, let's say, most of your life, and then suddenly you had food that had spices, you're going to want that. You know what I'm saying? Just imagine. We have so much spices in all our food now, we don't even think about it. You know, cinnamon and pepper and, and nutmeg and rosemary and all kinds of stuff. So this really, you know, especially for Europeans, have very bland food. All right, where are the Malakas? Well, they're over here by Indonesia, right? Here's Malaysia. Here's Papua New Guinea. And it's these islands right out here. All right, so you can look it up later. But that's where, there's the Malacca Sea. See, and so these islands over here. North of Australia, here's Timor. You've heard about them. They had the big tsunami, big earthquake. It's in that South Pacific area. That's where the spices come from. Well, the Portuguese were very successful. They, they pulled this off very quickly. How did they pull it off? This is usually where I stop and try to encourage students to not give up. It's about the end of the semester. Well, the Portuguese, first of all, had guns, gunpowder, weapons that most of these people they encountered did not have. That gave them an advantage. They were great sailors. They knew how to sail. They knew how to build ships. They knew how to navigate. So they were very mobile on the sea, and they had the advantage of gunpowder and technology. And then the third thing, they had a single goal. So this is usually where I, I mentioned to students that it's, it's not, over the years I've noticed, it's not always the smartest person who does best in my classes. Sometimes I'll meet somebody and say, yeah, that guy seems really bright, but he's not doing well in my class. Why? I suggest it's number three. You've got to have a single goal. You got to have a goal. You got to have focus. If you don't have focus, no matter how smart you are or how much chances you have, you're not going to do well. 
I met people that weren't, you know, I won't say they weren't that bright, but, you know, they had to work very hard. They worked very hard, and they did well, not only in my class, but in life. So get some goals, and as my grandfather used to say, you got to apply elbow grease. You know what elbow grease is? Working hard. That's what he meant by it. That's not going to happen unless you put the elbow grease on it. You put the elbow grease on it by working hard at it. See? <clears throat> elbow grease. Determination. Focus. That's going to make all the difference. Not only in your studies, but I think ultimately in your life. If you're distracted by, you know, the latest text message and uh, sitting around watching the Netflix all the time, and uh, so forth. It's pretty easy just to lay back and let the world pass you by. All right. I'm not saying I've got nothing against Netflix. I'm just saying, focus, focus, focus. So let's move on to our good buddy Chris, Chris Columbus. Now the Spanish wanted to get to these Spice Islands. You know, they wanted to get to China, Asia, India. That's where they wanted to go. Why? Because that's where the spices were. They knew the Portuguese had the other way sewn up, so they decide a kind of interesting idea. We're going to get east by going west. Huh? Pretty creative, huh? Yes? So if the spices came from the Malacca, the yeah, most Malacca, of them, uh huh. Sure. So the Arabs went there and actually bought the spice from Malacca? And a lot of people from India went there and brought it to India, and then the Arabs came to India and took it to the Arabs, and then the Arabs took it from there and say, sold it to the Europeans. So there was a whole chain of... Uh, so I don't think the Arabs ever made it that far. I'm pretty confident they did not. It was people from India, and other people sailed, and you know the people from India bought it, then they would kind of you know package it and market it and sell it out to others. So most of that stuff they did not produce at all. Just like the Arabs didn't produce it, just like the Portuguese don't produce it. Now, finally, the Portuguese would come and take over the islands and say, okay, you guys making this stuff, make it, and now we're just going to control the whole thing. So, the Spanish say, hey, let's go, let's go west to get east. And, a, and an Italian guy by the name of Chris Columbus comes with this idea. He's from the city of Genoa. Right around the same time, you see. A lot of stuff happened around 1500. Now, a lot of times people say, well, didn't everybody think the world was flat? I think most knowledgeable people thought the world was round. And in fact, people had kind of known that since ancient times. Now, there were, so it's not, it's not just the idea of thinking the world is flat, but let me ask you this. Have you ever been out on the open sea where you can't see any land? Yeah, yeah. maybe, okay. Have you been out there and never been there before and not been with anyone else who had never been there before? <laughs> Probably not. Today, if we go out there, usually we're out there, you know, like on a big cruise ship or something or some other kind of thing, and the people, we all, all these people know where they're going. We've got satellites. We've got GPS. We, got, we know where all the storms are coming. We know where everything is. We've got all kinds of maps. These, these people had to go out into that open sea where no one that they knew had ever been and no one on that ship had ever been out there. Now, so think about this. And they're small ships. They're small ships. They're about as long as this room is wide. That's about how big they are. Maybe a little bigger than that. Like maybe 40 feet long. 30, 40 feet long. They're not big ships. And you go out on a mighty big ocean. And you don't know what's out there. Now, so it takes courage. They didn't know how big it was. But certainly, they had no idea how big it was. And I think they kind of thought, like the Portuguese, that the world was a smaller place. So if we sail west to get east, it's probably actually going to be closer that way than if you sail east to get east. Does that make sense? Because you're not going to have to go around Africa, for one thing. I mean, if you didn't have to go around Africa, you could get from Europe to India pretty quickly. But you've got to go all the way down around Africa. And so, that's what he proposes to this lady right here. 
Queen Isabella, who was married to a guy named King Ferdinand. Ferdinand and Isabella had gotten married and actually unified Spain for the first time in a very long time under one leadership, under one family. Because remember, they have been actively pushing the Muslims out of Spain for a long time. They pushed the last Muslims out of Spain in 1492, the same year that Columbus lands in North America. That's when the final Muslims were pushed out of the southern part of Spain. Anyway, she likes the idea. All right, Columbus maybe charms her. I don't know, but anyway, she says, let's give it a shot. And so they do. They provide him with some ships. They provide him with some food and supplies and a crew. And okay, go knock yourself out. See what you can do. And so he sails off. And... Sure enough, he hits land, right? So Queen Isabella finances this expedition, and Columbus reaches the Americas in October of 1492. Get this, on Columbus Day. What are the odds? What are the odds that he would land on Columbus Day? Well, you'll have to think about those odds. It's a tough crowd, I'm telling you. It's a tough crowd. All right. Anyway, he lands on Columbus Day, 1492. All right, so now Columbus, I believe Columbus, and you know, I might be wrong, but I believe Columbus believed that he had reached Asia, and I think he believed that until he died. Because you know what? Sometimes we don't want to accept something that we don't want to accept. Right? Well, if, if you've not run into that, you will. People sometimes just don't want to accept what seems pretty obvious to other people. Now, eventually it becomes obvious to other people. Columbus had not reached the area near India or China. This was something completely different. Now, what you may not know, you probably know that Columbus sailed with the Nina, the, pin, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria, or something like that. Three small vessels, and then he came in 1492, which you might, and he explored Cuba and Haiti and the areas of the Caribbean. He thought it was, he thought it was closer to, to Asia, and so he ends up naming the islands the Indies, the, the, the islands near India. That's how it gets the name Indies. Now today, we call it the West Indies, but it still has the name Indies because of Columbus. But what you may not know is that actually Columbus did this four times. He did this sail in 1492. He also sailed in 1493, 1498, and 1502. He is searching for a way to get to those spices. I'm going to put a map up here in a second to show you all the places. He gets around the Caribbean quite a bit, he finds no spices. Because they grow in the Malacas, but they do not grow in the Caribbean islands. Right? He doesn't find any pepper or nutmeg. I don't know what he does find, but he doesn't find that. Okay? Now, others realize that this is a land that was unknown to the Europeans. The Europeans had heard of China. The Europeans had heard of India. You know? The Europeans had heard of Africa. And the Europeans pretty much thought they kind of knew the whole world. The world was Europe, Asia, Africa, that's it. And then water. Turns out that wasn't it. There were two other continents out there that didn't even know existed, and the world was a much bigger place. So here are all the routes of our buddy Christopher Columbus. Here are his routes. They're in different colors for the years. And his first one is in this kind of bluish, I'm going to call it a bluish color, right? This one. This is where he sails in. You see he gets to Cuba and Haiti around this area. San Salvador Island is where he lands, which is not too far from here, depending on how you measure things. We're down on the tip of Florida over here, so. Uh, and then he sails back. 
Then his second journey is in sort of the gold yellow color here. Look, he sails all around where he went gone before. He explores more of these islands. And then he sails back. Then the, the, uh, the third one is in this sort of greenish blue color, blue green kind of color. Teal, perhaps you call it. I don't know what you call it. And he sails down this way. Look, he goes all the way down to South America, down around Ghana, or Guyana, and uh, sails in this way and then sails out. And then look at the white, the last journey, 1502. He says, I got to keep going. So he's sailing out and he actually gets down around near Mexico and Central America, and all the way down by Panama, and comes back. So, in other words, he sails all over the Caribbean, hoping he's going to find these spices. He does not find the spices. By the way, this is why the people of this area are called Indians, because he thought it was India, and that it's the West Indies because he thought it was near India. And those names kind of stuck for a long time. Okay? Good enough. Now, many other explorers will then come. Once it becomes clear, there's a whole new world. Now, you can cue the Disney music for that. See? Yeah, I knew it. I knew I wouldn't have to encourage you too much on that. But anyway, it's a whole new world. You know, sometimes you regret the things you do. Anyway, it's a whole new world. <laughs> and it's a race then to the new world. John Cabot, another Venetian, Italian, but he sails for England, and he explores further north. Some people decided, well, maybe Columbus had the right idea. He's just going the wrong direction. This land that's in our way, and we call North America, South America, that's in our way. We don't want it. We've got to find a way around it. Columbus looked for a way to the south. Let's look for a northern passage, a northern way around this landmass. And so that's what Cabot was looking for when he ran into Newfound land, the land that he newly found, Newfoundland, and uh, New England. He claims all that land for England, hence the name New England, um, and so forth. That's John Cabot. He claims it for King Henry VII of England, who was the father of King Henry VIII that we talked about last time, if you were here last time, but you, some of you weren't. But you can listen to it. I'm sure you've all listened to it already, so you know what I'm talking about. Okay, so it's all the same period then, right? Henry the Seventh, I am, I am. So here is Cabot's uh, routes. Here is Columbus's routes. Then uh, other Spaniards come. Here is Cortez, or Cortez. He comes over, and his route is in the red. And he decides, I'm going to figure this out. He goes on land, he marches across Central America, and, you know, southern part of Mexico. And he, when he gets over there, he finds out, Ooh, there's more water over there, but we are a long ways from China, I'm afraid. So some people call this body of water right here, south of California, the Gulf of Cortez. Other people call it the Gulf of California. Yes? Um, my question is like for these sailors, like they weren't afraid for like a beast or... Like, the sailors weren't afraid for what? Like what do you mean? Beast, like animals. Like alligators? Or, yeah, but... Sea dragons? Yeah, things not like, you know, when you, you know, like you, they see a new land, you know, you know, the people, savages. Sure. Well, I was, can, what I'm mostly afraid about is Godzilla. <laughs> Have you seen Godzilla? Godzilla comes up out of the water. You know, and then and then that flying turtle thing. What's a flying turtle? Gamera. Woo! Now you guys got to watch some Gamera and Godzilla movies. Anyway, that'll make you afraid. They were afraid of a lot of things. There were some stories about you know maybe monst sea monsters or large you know maybe they were whales, maybe they were squid. That sometimes you know some of these stories did circulate, and of course there was a lot of fear. There was a lot of fear because. You're out here in the middle of nowhere, and you can run out of food, you can run out of water, you can run into a big storm like a hurricane. You know, they're sailing over here a lot of times in hurricane season, and they do get caught in these storms. So, there's all kinds of fear. Even like for savages, like on the, you know, the people on the land. Savages! Right. I see we can't use that word, savages, anymore. 
You mean the native people who might try to defend their homelands? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> and of course, then they had to prove to their benefactors they'd actually been here. And so they, they would capture or convince some of these people to go with them back to Spain to say, look, here's what the people look like here. I was actually really at another place. I didn't just sail off there and hang out for a little while and then come back. You know, kind of like the guys that you send out to put out flyers for you, and the guy just throws all the flyers in the trash can, hangs out at the Starbucks, and then comes back six hours later and gets paid. I'm not saying anybody's ever done that. I'm just saying, yes. All right, let's move on. Other voyages. How about Pedro Cabral? You like that name? I like the name Pedro. In fact, I would vote for Pedro if it was up to me. But I don't get to vote for Pedro, sadly. Or Pancho. I would vote. I like the name Pancho. I think that's a good name, too. Pancho. Pancho, Pedro. But I think Vasco is the best. That the Vasco is the name of the hour. I think each hour we should pick the best name that should go top of our list for somebody to name their child. I and I think you like Pedro the best. I do. Okay. It's common. It's more common now. Yeah, but no, that's what you don't want. I think Vasco. It starts with a V and ends with an O. How how can you go wrong? Anyway, Pedro Cabral is a Portuguese guy. He's trying to sail down around Africa again, you know, like the Portuguese are doing. But he accidentally, because he gets caught in a storm, probably part of a hurricane or something, he gets blown off course and all of a sudden he washes ashore at some place. He doesn't know where it is. It turns out he's in what we would call Brazil today. So he, while he's there, he says, hey, by the way, this all belongs to Portugal now, which is what these guys did. So he accidentally, around 1500, lands in South America. And, uh, and so he calls, the, you know, he takes the land. Now, this is why people in Portugal speak Portuguese, but people in Brazil speak Portuguese instead of Spanish because of Portuguese, because this guy got blown off course. So they weren't colonized by? They were not, well, they eventually, yes. I mean, they did send missions there, and they started to work there. And if you want to watch people like movies, you want to watch an old movie, you could watch the movie called The Mission. You ever heard of the movie called The Mission? It has, I think, Robert De Niro, a couple of unknown actors. One of them is Robert De Niro, and I think the other one's Daniel Day Lewis. And they're in the movie called The Mission. You can look it up. It was like 1998 or something like that. Anyway, it's about this thing where there, there are Spanish missionaries and there are Portuguese, and, you know, it has a Spanish mission and the Portuguese are there. And there's going to be a lot of conflict and fighting between them over who's going to control this. Anyway, you can watch the movie. I won't give you a spoiler alert. But it does involve a flute. I won't tell you that much. That's all I can tell you. It involves a flute. Is it a magic flute? No. Well, maybe. Depends on how you define magic. I don't want to spoil it for you. Are there any walking trees in it? I don't know. Anyway, now how about another guy named Amerigo Vespucci? Amerigo Vespucci. He's another Italian. He's from Florence. He does several voyages. He sails across, and he begins to map the New World. So when people would say, I want to look at those maps that Amerigo Vespucci has been drawn of the New World, those Amerigo maps, the maps of Amerigo, the maps of America. That's how we get the name America, because of this guy's name is Amerigo. That's where it came from, Italian guy's first name. And it kind of stuck, right? People are Americans, they're from North America, they're from South America, they're from Central America, but it's got America in the name. It's from his name, America. Good thing his name wasn't something like Steve. The North and South Stevonia or something. I don't know. Stevia. Stevia? That's some kind of some kind of drug. It's a sugar. People take people it's a drug. It's like a drug. People, people get addicted sugar. to it. It's like sort of like sort of like heroin. Anyway. 
That'd be good. Put that out there. This is on YouTube. People will listen to it. They'll Google it. And it'll come up. Stevia equals heroin. And I'll get sued. No, no. I'm sure it's a fine product. All right. That was just a joke for those of you listening at home. Of which there's like nobody. Okay. Now. <laughs> hey, I have, no, I have no delusions of grandeur. All right. Now let's talk about the treaty of Tortosilla. By the way, have you eaten lunch yet? No. Over in the cafeteria, they got some Tortosilla over there, one of those things. And with a little salsa, I hear it's pretty good. Salsa with the Tortosilla. Mmm, delicious. Maybe some refried rice, refried, refried beans, and some, and some, some rice. Mmm, and Tortosillas. Hey, Cinco de Mayo's coming up. When, I want you to go into one of those restaurants, you know, where they have the Cinco de Mayo stuff, and ask him for some, some tortillas. See what they say. <laughs> they probably throw you out. Get out of here! We don't have time for you. Talking about tortillas. Well, no, the Treaty of Tortillas has got nothing to do with Mexican food. Well, indirectly, maybe. But no, it doesn't. What is the Treaty of Tortosilla, you ask? I'm glad you asked. The Treaty of Tortosilla is a treaty that divides up the world between the Portuguese and the Spanish. Did they ask anybody else what they thought? No, we don't care, basically. Who brokers this deal? It's the Pope. Because remember, the Portuguese are Roman Catholic, the Spanish are Roman Catholic. We don't want the Portuguese and the Spanish fighting each other. We'd rather have them fighting or converting non-Catholics and making them Catholics. So since the Portuguese already controlled this area going around Africa and heading that way, and now the Spanish have been sailing over this way, they said, hey, let's just draw a line. They're going to call that the line of demarcation. The line of demarcation is drawn here in this red line vertically. Why? So it could include part of Brazil. Why? Because our buddy Cabral had accidentally landed there and the Portuguese had claimed it. So to avoid warfare between the Portuguese and the Spanish on the sea and on land, they drew this line of demarcation. They said everything on the left side of that line, everything to the west of that line was Spanish territory. Everything to the east of that line was Portuguese. Then eventually they had to kind of add another line onto it out around the Philippines. The Philippines are sort of the outer limit of what the Spanish control. And then the Portuguese get the rest of the um, Indian Ocean and so forth. All right? By the way, they did not ask anybody else. They didn't, like, you know, go down to Portugal or go down to Brazil and say, hey, you guys want to be controlled by the Portuguese? No, they didn't ask them. They just took it over. Okay. But this is all drawn up by the Pope in 1494, the Treaty of Tortosilla, and it divides up the world at that time into two spheres, two hemispheres, or whatever you want to call it, two, two zones of occupation or control. A Spanish side is on the left of this map, and the Portuguese side on the right. Does that make sense? Because the Pope does not want fighting between these two. He sees that as counterproductive. But what he does want them to do, of course, is not only go out there and make money and get rich, but to allow Roman Catholic missionaries to show up and set up missions and convert the local people into you know, good Roman Catholics. And by and large... Um, that does happen, especially in South America, Central America. Most of the folks down there still today are Roman Catholics. This is why. Okay. Everybody have that? Some people were writing furiously, but now they aren't, so I'm going to move on. Spanish conquistadors. Well, one of the things that the Spanish do is instead of just sort of passively, you know, the Portuguese were pretty much, uh, they were pretty much satisfied with just setting up trade. But in Central and South America and North America, 
There's not the kind of goods there that the Spanish can really capitalize on. There are no spices, for example. There is some gold, and there is some silver, but they don't know quite where it's coming from, right? So, but they do want the gold and the silver. Don't, don't get me wrong. And they, they will get the gold and the silver. But there's not, uh, not the spices and a lot of the other things. Mostly it's land. So the Spanish decide they will use this to settle, and then they also begin to, you know, growing things. Setting up plantations and that kind of thing. One of the big products that's going to start to be grown here is sugar cane. The Europeans developed a real sweet tooth. There was no sugar in Europe. How did anybody get anything sweet in Europe? The only way you could get anything sweet in Europe was to use honey. Honey was the sweetest substance that the Europeans had. But pretty soon they were introduced to sugar and sugar cane, and they liked it a lot. Okay? Just like you do, probably. Do you like the sugar? I think you probably do like the sugar. Do you like the soft drinks? They're filled with sugar. Do you like the desserts? Do you like the pie, the cookies, the brownies? The brownies that you're going to have at my house tomorrow night? Will you like them? I think you will. See, it all comes back to the party on Friday night. Well, anyway, uh, so they begin to grow things. Now, to do that, they need to conquer the land. And they actually met some fairly formidable people here. And they conquer this, what they're going to call the New World, or what is, has been called the New World. Obviously, it's not new to the people living there. It's new to the Europeans, and they didn't know it was here. Now, the thing is, the Spanish conquistador had lots of advantages, just like the Portuguese had lots of advantages when they took over those islands in the South Pacific. One of these things, they had horses. They had, they had gunpowder and guns. They had steel. They had, they had all these things. They had armor. The other thing that came with the Spanish that the people in North and South America had never experienced were a lot of diseases. Because you have an isolated population. You remember we talked about the Black Plague, or the bubonic plague. When that swept through Europe, it, it devastated Europe, right? The new diseases that the Europeans bring with them, different kinds of influenza, the measles, uh, stuff like that. This, this kind, this really begins to, to wipe people out in America, in the Americas. Okay? And so that's going to make it easier for the Spanish. And so they end up conquering. They conquer Hernan Cortez. 15, 19 to 15, 21. He will conquer... Uh, the Aztec Empire, which was really at its peak about this time, both the Incas and the Aztecs were pretty much at their peak of power when the Spanish show up. Real bad timing for them, right? Well, all the way around, bad for them. But you know, they're 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 sort of. And by the way, you know, they weren't just real nice guys themselves. They weren't just getting along, and being friendly with each other. They were conquering people themselves, and they could, had created an empire. But when the Spanish show up. Not only do they bring these diseases with them, but they have steel weapons, they have gunpowder, they have horses. The people saw people on horses, and, and they didn't know what to make of it. Is this a, some kind of creature, you know, like sort of with a human head and a, another kind of body? I mean, that's what... And, of course, you know, even when they figured out that wasn't it, you know, a horse is a powerful animal that can move quickly and... They didn't have anything like that. There were no horses in North America at that point. That's where they all came from, mostly the Spanish. Anyway, then, of course, he takes the Aztecs. The Spanish will take the Aztecs and control their territory in Mexico and Central America. And eventually they'll move up and they'll take control of Mexico as well. What about in South America, you ask? I'm glad you asked. In South America, the same kind of thing happens with our good buddy Francisco Pizarro. There's a good name for you. That's, that's not that uncommon with Francisco. I still think Vasco is the best name of the hour. Vasco. But Francisco Pizarro will move to the south with the Inca Empire, which again was a well-organized 
uh, along the west side of South America. They had a mountain area and they had a coastal area. They had long roads. There's a lot more we could say about them. Your book tells you a little more about them. But they end up taking that territory as well. And when the Spanish are there, you know, they do write down some of what they see because these, these people do not have a written language. We don't have a lot of books and information of them. But we do find out about it here. And of course, it's devastating for both these empires. So you have Pizarro in the south with the Incas. You have Cortez further north uh, with the Aztecs. And of course, we already said the Portuguese had landed and claimed Brazil, and they began to sort of occupy that more by 1535. So as you can see, in the early 1500s, you have the discovery, in quotes, right? And then you have the conquering and occupation. But by the time you get to, say, 1530, 1540, most of this territory has been claimed. A lot of it has been occupied. And uh, we see a very different world than we saw, say, uh, 50 years earlier. Because now we've got this global market. The Portuguese are bringing spices in. They're doing all kinds of trade, making money. The Spanish are bringing in silver and gold. We've got great inflation taking place in Europe. And just the world is a much bigger place in people's minds. Much bigger place now. From, you know, from China to North America, South America, Africa. All these things were new discoveries to the Europeans. All right, we'll end it there. Do not forget, of course...